morning. Um, we started last week a new series going through the book of Isaiah, and last week we just covered one verse in Isaiah 118, and it says, Come now, let us reason together. Uh, though your sins be like scarlet, I will wash them as white as snow. And, uh, and so the, we talked about salvation last week, about how all of us are sinners and we all have this stain of sin on our lives. And the only thing to eliminate that is the blood of Jesus. And, and so we talked last week, that's online if you're interested. And so today we're in Isaiah chapter 6. Now we're going to, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah has got 66 chapters. We're not going to, that would take us two years to get through all of it. Uh, so we're going to just go through and cover some of the highlights. So this week is in Isaiah 6, and we're going to look at verse 1 through 8. And I want you to bring your Bible every week, okay? If you have a Bible, I want you to turn there. I know some of you have it on your phones, uh, but if I catch you texting while I'm preaching, um, I have an eject button for your seat and go through the roof. I'm just kidding. No, but uh, no, I, I don't like to, when I'm in a service like this, I don't like to look at the Bible on my phone because it's, then someone texts me and texts me, and then I'm like, oh, and then I get distracted. So, um, so I like having a hard copy of God's Word. If you, there, there's some under the seats, too, if you want that. But we're in Isaiah chapter 6, and verse 1. We're just going to go through this and look at this together, and then we'll go to lunch. How's that sound? And then we'll go watch the Chiefs win. Amen? All right. So Isaiah 6, 1 says, it was, it was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their face, uh, their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So really quick, I wanna, I wanna, as we go through this, I want to try to teach you guys some things. Now, whenever, Isaiah, whenever it says, and Isaiah wrote this, whenever he says that he saw the Lord, um, he didn't really see the Lord, okay? And here's what I mean by that. The Bible says that nobody's able to look at God and live. No, nobody. They're, like, if he really saw the Lord, like, he saw a glimpse of God. He saw a glimpse of what heaven was like. But if he really saw the Lord, he, you guys remember uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark when they, they when the guy's face melted off because he because he was holding the cup or whatever. And that's what would happen. If you could lock eyes with God, if God would appear right now and show himself to you, your face would melt off. The, the Bible says no one can look at God in all of his glory and, and live. That's just the way that it is. There's a story in the Old Testament uh, about Moses got to see the Lord. He got to see part of the Lord. I don't, I don't know how this works, but it says he asked to see God, and God said, you can't, you can't see me. And, and Moses persisted, and so he goes, all right, I'm going to let you see my hind parts. And I don't know what that means, I, but, but he, goes, he goes, I'm going to let you see the backside of me. He goes, so he put Moses up in the cleft of the rock, and he passed by, and he let Moses kind of look at basically like the radiance of him. He, he didn't see God in all of his, all of his glory. He, he would have, his face would have melted off. Okay, so this story is, is a scene where Isaiah got to, he, he had a vision of what heaven was like, okay? And when I, whenever I talk about this, I want you to think about this. Just like we can't see God, um, if, if I had a vision of heaven, I wouldn't be able to come back and ex explain what it would be like, okay? There's just not the right, I don't have the vocabulary, nobody has the right words to describe. So we could talk all day about here's what heaven, because that, that's one of the things that we, we talk about a lot. People ask me all the time, what's heaven going to be like? I'm like, I don't know. The reality is I just don't know. It's going to be an awesome place, but I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it smells like. I don't know what it sounds like. I, it, it's all just left up to most of it to our imagination. We get some glimpses of it in the Bible, but I know it's going to be an awesome place. It's a place I'm looking forward to going, but to describe it to you, like if God would say, Joe, here, here it is, I, I, like, I can't describe it to you. And so there, that happens several times in the Bible. And so in Revelation 4, if you want to write that off on the side, you can go look at this later, but in Revelation 4, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, he had a similar experience to Isaiah, and he had a, uh, he said that he was caught up in the spirit, or uh, um, it, it says that he was, yeah, he was caught up in the spirit, and he saw a vision of heaven, and what he saw was similar to what Isaiah saw. He saw like a throne, a throne room, and angels praising God, and, and kind of like a worship service, 
And then there was another scene, and this is in your notes if you're taking notes, but in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul had this vision of heaven. And, you know, and I didn't mention this first service, but a lot of, a lot of theologians believe that when there was one time when uh, Paul got stoned, not like he didn't get stoned like this, but, but there were times where he would go into a city and, and they would throw rocks at his head. They would stone him. One, and one time he was left for dead. They were like, all right, he's had enough. Let's leave. And then he got up and eventually dusted himself off and went back in the city and preached some more. But, uh, but some people suggest that maybe during one of those times where he got knocked unconscious, he had a vision of heaven. I don't know when it was, but here's what it says. The Apostle Paul goes, he goes, I was caught up to the third heaven. He's talking about this experience he had. He goes, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in the body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yet, oh, yeah, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. No uh, things no human is allowed to tell. So that's what I was saying. Like, I don't even have the vocabulary to be able to describe it, and neither does he. But I want to I talk to you about this and teach you this really quick, because he says the third heaven. And there's been a lot made about this. There's a lot of false doctrine predicated on this verse right here. And, and so here's what, here's what the Bible teaches. So there's three level, there's, there's three heavens, okay? And heaven's just um, a metaphor. So the first heaven is like our atmosphere, like the sky. Like this is the first heaven. The second heaven, according to the Bible, is outer space. It's beyond our atmosphere. And then the third heaven is where God dwells. That's, that's the place where God's at, where the angels are at. Okay, so there's the first heaven's atmosphere. Second heaven is outer space. And then God's in the third heaven. And, and so Paul says, I was caught up to the third heaven. And the reason why this is so important and why I want to make a point about this is because we live, or I do, I live in Independence, Missouri. And this is the... This is the, the place where Joseph Smith, you know, Joseph Smith was the founder of the Mormon religion, and Joseph Smith was here, and he believed that this was, like, up on the square, that that's going to be the new Zion. He believed that that's where Jesus is coming back. That's why they built that spiral temple, so when Jesus comes down, he's going to slide down it, and, but, but that's, <laughs> not really, but that's, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun, because people ask me all the time at our church, they're like, what, you know, I'm new at this, so what, what do, you know, what is it that the Mormons believe that's different than us? And I just, there's a lot of things, mainly the Bible, and, and, and I don't, and I'm not trying to poke fun, but the, 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 basically the Mormon religion, let me, let me just talk to you about this, because, so what Joseph Smith teaches, what he taught, and what the Book of Mormon teaches, is that there's three levels to heaven. So, like, everyone, when you die, you're going to go to one or two places, one of, one of three places. Put it on the screen, please. Um, There's just a little chart here, but they, they believe that the first, like, when you die, you go to, you can either go to the lowest one, which is the celestial kingdom, or the next one's the terrestrial kingdom, or the top one is the celestial kingdom, and that's where God's at. Now, here's why that's wrong, mainly because the Bible, okay, but when we go back and look at that, so what they say is, I, I had another chart that I should have put in here, but basically it's, it's, it's based on your deeds, what you do. If you're like a bad person and, and you're like Jeffrey Dahmer and you eat people, you go to the telestial people, telestial pe uh, kingdom right there. But, uh, and then the next one is if you do some more good deeds. But the third one, they say if you like go to church and you go on like a two-year mission with the church and, and if you tithe and you do all these things, you do all these religious things, what happens is you get to, when you die, you go to the celestial kingdom and in there, and this is, this is why I have a huge problem with that because they, be, they teach that you'll be equal with God. You'll be on the same level with God. And I'm just telling you flat out, that is, that, that is an apostasy, okay? That, that is false doctrine, okay? There, I, I, I'm ter when I get done with this message today, I want you to go away just understanding that God is holy and we are not. Wait, like when, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he, he was just freaked out. Like God, God is on this level. We're on this level here. You're never, I don't care how good of a person you are. I don't care what all good things you do for the Lord. doesn't matter. When you die and you, if you go to heaven because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you go to heaven, God is still going to be here and you're going to be here. You are never going to be equal with him. Okay, it's blasphemy to even suggest such a thing. But that's why some of the things, okay, I, just so you know, 
uh, when I first got saved 25 years ago, because there's so many Mormons in this area, or RLDS, or they were called at that time, now it's Community of Christ, um, and there was a lady that used to go to church with me and Chad and some other people, and she was part of that church for 50 years, and then she came out of that when she got saved, and she wrote a couple of books, and she used to teach me, because she, she, I wanted to know. I wanted to know what's the difference between them and what, what we believe, and she said, basically, it's the Bible, and everything's predicated on their, their faith on whether or not Joseph Smith was a real prophet, which I don't believe, and she documented all of the false prophecies, all of the things that either didn't happen or went the other way, and the Bible says in Deuteronomy 13 that if you're a prophet, if you if you become a false prophet, if what you prophesy doesn't come to pass, then they're to take you outside the city and stone you to death, okay? And people aren't to follow you anymore is, is what it says. And, and so there was, I don't know if you know how Joseph Smith, you can go read about all this, you can watch some YouTube videos, but Joseph Smith, who was around in like the 1820s, and, and he, um, he had this Abe Lincoln hat. Remember the Abe Lincoln hat, the tall thing? He would take that hat, and he would put his face in there for like 12 hours a day. And he would just be in there, just in a trance. And then he would come out and he would write some stuff down. And that's how he supposedly got the Book of Mormon. And like he would have his face in there for all day long. And his wives and kids are like, what's daddy doing? You know, he's got his face in And he's supposedly getting revelation. And he's not. I, he needed medication is what he needed. You know what I mean? And, I, and I'm not trying to poke fun. I'm not trying to make fun of the, the Mormon religion. But, I, but it's, this is really crucial, okay, because the, the Book of Mormon is not true. It's just made up out of his imagination, and so is the, the Book of the Covenants and all that, and the Bible. That's why I always tell you guys, if you just stick with the Bible, you're going to be okay. So if somebody comes along like Joseph Smith did and goes, I got this new teaching, you're like, well, let's test it up against what the Bible says, and if you do that, you find out that he's a liar, that he's not telling you the truth, and he's leading people astray. So I wanted to just put that out there, okay? So uh, let, let me talk about this for a second, okay? Let me talk about the, uh, people will ask me, I feel, I feel questions all the time from people, they go, okay, Pastor Joey, what about, there's all kinds of people that say that they've had this experience where they, uh, they, they go to heaven and they come back, or they go to hell, there's a guy who supposedly spent 23 minutes in hell, and he wrote a book about it, and there's like a movie made. And there was, there was a little boy that supposedly went to heaven and came back, remember? And, and that particular one, he was found, he, he admitted later that he lied about the whole thing. But so if people ask me, what do you think about that? What, what do you think? And here's my response. Put, put it on the screen. Somebody tells me they went to heaven and came back, or they went to hell and came back. I'm just, I'm like the skeptical dog. I'm like, now listen, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm, I'm not saying that. God, could God do that? Absolutely. God could take me to heaven or to, if he wanted to, he could do whatever he wants. But when somebody comes to me and says, I, I, I was in heaven and I came back, I'm like, eh, I don't know. Okay. It just, we, we just have to test it against what the Bible says. Okay. But I'm, I'm really skeptical about stuff. I think most of those are, you know, you had some bad anchovies or something like that. And that's what, that's what explains that. Um, so you can just leave this up there just for a second. In just a second, I'm a, we're going to watch this video because there's a, it, this is a, a, a video about explaining about angels. There's a lot of confusion about angels. And again, if we would just stick with what the Bible says, we, li we live in a society where people, um, okay, so all the time people will say this, and I know there's people in this room and you're going to, if you got hate mail, you know, send it to Pastor Chuck, okay? Uh, email Pastor Chuck at gracesfree.org because he's not here today. He's out of town, so you can email him with your hate mail. But listen, when, this is true. This is biblical, okay? I don't care what your grandmother told you. I don't care what your mother, mom taught you. When you die, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you go to heaven, you don't become an angel. You, everyone in this room, none of you will ever become an angel. You won't have wings when you die. I hear people all that just heard it this week. They were like, so-and-so uh, graduated and got their wings in heaven. And like, I mean, they might be in heaven, but they don't, they're not flying around. They don't have wings. All of that is just stuff that we make up to, to make ourselves feel better. And, and it's just not true. So um, now that I've ticked off some of you guys, we're going to watch the video. This, this explains a lot about angels from a biblical standpoint. Let's watch this. We've been talking about spiritual beings in the Bible, and we've looked at how God is in the heavenly realms, but not by himself. There's a whole staff team that the Bible calls the Divine Council. But in the Bible, there are still more beings in the spiritual realm, 
like the Cherubim and also the Angels. So let's talk about them. Okay, first, the Cherubim. These are chubby little babies with wings, right? No, you gotta get that image out of your head. Cherubim, or in Hebrew, Cherubim, they're way more fascinating. They're described as hybrid creatures, a collage of different animals, and every time they do appear, they look a little bit different. That's intense. Yeah, they're supposed to be intimidating. They stand guard at the boundary between heaven and earth. If you see them, you know you're entering the presence of the one who is above all and truly other. The first time cherubim show up in the story of the Bible, they're standing outside of the Garden of Eden. Right, the garden is God's temple residence, and so he places these spiritual bodyguards at the entrance so that the rebel humans can't get back in and ruin everything. But the biblical story is about how God wants us back in his presence. Yes, exactly. So this is why he chose the people of Israel and gave them the gift of a symbolic miniature Eden called the tabernacle, and then later the Jerusalem temple. In both of these spaces, cherubim were painted and engraved all over, reminding the priests that they are working in God's presence. Now, if a priest went into the Holy of Holies, he would see there a golden box called the Ark of the Covenant, and on it were two cherubim. What's going on here? Well, the biblical authors describe the Ark as the footstool of God's throne, which the cherubim are carrying. Like we read in Psalm 99, God sits enthroned above the cherubim. But there was no actual throne above the box. Right, the Israelites weren't supposed to represent God with any physical image. But when the prophets had visions about this space, they saw Yahweh sitting on his throne. Okay, so cherubim guard the sacred space, carry God's throne, but why do they look like animal mashups? Well, they're symbolic representations of all the creatures of the earth because they all belong to God. This is why in Isaiah's vision, all of the creatures are singing, everything that fills the earth is God's glory. Like a choir. Yeah, through the cherubim, all creation offers praise to its maker. Great, that's the cherubim. Now let's talk about angels. I'm way more familiar with them, human-like figures with feathery wings. No, wait, stop. Angels in the Bible don't have wings. What? No wings? No angel wings. In fact, angels are often mistaken for people because they look like us, just a bit more impressive. But the cherubim have wings. Yeah, and the angels are different because they have a different purpose. Okay, which is? Well, humans can't just march into God's realm, so God will reach out to us, and he often does so through these spiritual ambassadors. So angels are like spiritual messengers. Yeah, in fact, that's what the word angel means, a messenger. Right, this happens a lot in the Bible, like the angel who tells Mary she's pregnant with Jesus. Yeah, and then the other main role of angels is to perform missions on God's behalf. Sometimes they rescue people from danger, like when Peter is released from prison. And there's some really cool angels, like Michael and Gabriel. Yeah, the name Gabriel means God is my power, and Michael means who is like God. But also notice, these names point to God, not to the angels. Like humans, the angels are images of God's presence and power. But still, how cool would it be to meet an angel? Yeah, and maybe you will, and maybe you already have. But no one in the Bible is ever encouraged to go looking for angels. And when angels do show up, people are usually puzzled or freaked out. So angels are really awesome, but they play a supporting role in the Bible. Yes, because God's ultimate purpose is to bring humans back into his presence in a reunited heaven and earth. And in the meantime, he uses angels to guide and to serve his people. All right, hope that helps you and cleared up some things. But uh, we're going to get back into the story. So in verse 4 of Isaiah 6, so th this scene happens where God is on the throne and there are seraphim who uh, is most, people, most theologians believe are different than cherub, cher uh, cherubs and um, cherubim. And differently, these guys had six uh, wings. They had with two of them they flew, they, two of the wings covered their face and two wings covered their feet. And so here's what it says. In verse 4, it says, their voices shook the temple to its foundations. The entire building was filled with smoke. Now, I read that, and I was like, they got a smoke machine in heaven. You know what I mean? Like, I've been to some churches. One of these days, we're going to have one up here. Like, nowadays, churches have, like, hazers, and they, they put it, and it looks really cool, have a light show. But, uh, and, and some people are really against that. Some people are like, back in my day, we just had the organ and all that. But I'm like, hey, when you get to heaven... There's going to be a smoke machine. Like, seriously, that, like this is biblical. There was, the whole room was filled with smoke. 
either that or they were smoking some meat or something. I don't know. I don't know what kind of meat it was. Maybe they, maybe they cooked one of those cherubs. I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm, uh, but they, there was filled with smoke. And um, so and then let's go on in verse 5. It says, then I said, then I said, it's all over. So, so there's Isaiah. He says, I saw a glimpse of the Lord. He says, then it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. And I have sinful lips or I have filthy lips and I live among people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. And so I want you to understand about that. When Isaiah caught a glimpse of God in heaven, he just felt like he fell on his face before God. You know what that's called? It's called prostrate, prostrating yourself, not prostate. That's a different sermon altogether. But prost- prostrate means to lay yourself out fully and, and, and bow down to, it, it's, it's an act of humiliation on our part, of humbling ourselves. And because that, I want you to understand that this is really the only proper response. If you ever caught a glimpse of God in any way, the only response you would ever have is, oh my gosh, turn, you need to turn away from me. I need to turn away from you because I'm, I'm, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. I'm not worthy to see your glory. That, that's what it is. It's, there, there was a guy years ago, um, I used to listen to, uh, I don't know if you ever listened to the Bible Answer Man. He used to be on 92.3. He's been off the air for uh, probably four or five years now, um, maybe not, not that long ago. But when I first got saved many years ago, uh, I, I would listen to that in my car, and I would learn a lot. And it was Hank Kennegraff, and he was just a really smart guy who knew a lot about the Bible, and he was called the Bible Answer Man. And people would call in and ask him questions about any number of things, and he would just answer it. It's really smart, and uh, I learned a lot from the guy. I still have a lot of respect for him, even though he's not on the air anymore. Um, but one time, somebody called in, and they said, they said this. The guy goes, he was mad. He, you could tell he was just really upset, and he goes, I'm an atheist. He goes, I don't even believe there's, there's God. He goes, but if I'm wrong, and someday when I die, I have to stand before God, he goes, I'm not going to bow down at his feet. I'm going to spit in his face. And I remember listening, thinking, I don't remember what Hank Hennegraff told him, but I remember thinking, you ain't going to do nothing. Like, like Jesus let people spit in his face when he walked on earth because he was a humble servant. You ain't going to do that in heaven. I'm just telling you right now. Like the only thing that you're going to do, and the Bible says that someday every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Even if you don't want to. There are people who live their lives and they don't want anything to do with God. They hate God. But someday they're going to stand before him and they're going to be, he's going to force them to bow their knee and they're going to confess that he is Lord. They're, that's going to happen. You ain't going to get a chance to spit in his face. You, you, he let that happen once. That ain't ever going to happen again. So people are just confused about this. You, you have to understand that, that God is, he's holy. He's on a different level than us. Um, so there's a, this thing happened to me. Years ago, I used to, um, w- when I was probably in my 20s, I was really into fitness. And, and I still kind of am. But uh, you guys know the older you get, the harder it is to stay in shape and lose weight. And uh, when, when I was in my 20s, I could eat whatever I wanted and I was still skinny. And, but anyways, I used to go to the gym, and, and at that time I was taking some protein shakes, and I was probably early 20s, and, and I was like, I was trying to bulk up, and I, I was always small, so I'm not, don't get me wrong. But I was looking in the mirror, and I was just really impressed with the gains that I had. You ever done that before? You're like, and I'm, I'm flexing, I'm showing my muscles, and I'm like this in the mirror, and I'm like, man, I'm really, I, you know, I'm really getting bulked up. And then this big old hulk of a dude come walking in and stood next to me. And I'm like, I'm just going to go home now. <laughs> because that's what it was. I was like, compared to what I used to be, I was like, I look pretty good. But compared to this dude, I'm like, it's over. You know, I'm done. I'm not even working out today. And I, I just left. I was so embarrassed and humiliated. And I want you to understand that that's how it is. I talked about this last week. You can compare yourself to another person in this room. The person sitting next to you might be a horrible person. They probably are. I'm just kidding. No, but, but we, we do that. Like people, uh, well, I might be bad. I got my stuff, but I'm not as bad as this person over here. That might be true. You could compare yourself to Jeffrey Dahmer or Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden. You know, those are bad. They're bad people. But they're not the standard. We're supposed to compare ourselves to Jesus. And when you compare yourself to Jesus, it's like, I, I, can't, I have to leave your presence. Like there's no... And the only thing it causes you to do is to go, I'm unclean. I'm un- it, 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 it's like a self-realization that I am not God. I am not on his level at all. 
And that's what God wants. God wants us to always remember that he's up here and we're down here. Now, does he love us? What which makes it even that much more incredible that he even talks to us. You know what I mean? Like that he, that he sent his son. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you on the cross because God loves you that much. Now, when you understand how holy he is and how awesome he is, that dude wants to have a relationship with me? That's incredible. That's the amazing part of grace right there, that he even has anything to do with. Let me, I want to read this. This is kind of lengthy, but put, go ahead and put it up on the screen. So this is from an article on, uh, I want you to understand, like, what holiness is. Like, if, if you were to ask me, Pastor Joey, uh, tell me what holiness is, I would probably have a hard time coming up with a, a, a succinct definition, you know, uh, but so this is a long paragraph to kind of help you understand what holiness is. And if, by the way, this is from an article from the website gotquestions.org. And so if you're interested, uh, if you have questions about like what are angels or, you know, who's Jesus, just any number of things, if you got anything question about Christianity or about the Bible, go to that website, you put it in the little search bar, and it comes up with an article. And so let me read this. This will help you understand the, the holiness of God. Okay, this says, the holiness of God is the most difficult of all God's attributes to explain, partly because one of his essential attributes, it is one of his essential attributes that is not shared inherently by man. We, were, we are created in God's image, and we can share many of his attributes to a much lesser extent, of course, love, mercy, faithfulness, etc. But some of God's attributes, such as omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence, okay, so God, God is all everywhere all at once. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. That's what those words mean. Um, he says that they, they will never be shared by created beings. Uh, similarly, holiness is not something that we will possess as an inherent part of our nature. We only become holy in relationship to Christ. It is an imputed holiness. Um, only in Christ do we become the righteousness of God. God's holiness is what separates him from all other beings what makes him separate and distinct from everything else. God's holiness is more than just his perfection or sinless purity. It is the essence of his otherness, his transcendence. God's, holy, God's holiness embodies the mystery of his awesomeness and causes us to gaze and wonder at him as we begin to comprehend just a little of his majesty. So I hope you uh, hope hope that makes sense to you. And that's the website right there. I go to that. I go there all the time. You got questions. Um, Gotquestions.org. And so just wanted you to know we're on His level. Now, even though He's on a different level, here's a just really quick. I'm gonna give you two verses. And there's there's a lot of verses in the Bible that tell us, okay, God is holy, and He wants us to be holy. Like because He's holy, He. So how do we do that? Since He's on a different level, well, we're supposed to emulate Him. Jesus said. You know, let your light shine, different things like that. But look in Levit Leviticus 20, verse 7. It says, so set yourselves apart to be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Now, if you have like the NIV or the New King James, it says consecrate. I love that word. Con you know what it means to be consecrated? God expects everyone in here who's a follower of Jesus to be consecrated. That means to be set apart. That means the world is going this direction, and we all go, hey, with all due respect, y'all can go off a cliff if you want, but we're consecrated to God. Like, we're, we're sticking with the Bible. We're not, gonna, we're not going that direction. That's what consecrated means. And then 1 Peter 1.15 says, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. Now, uh, let, me, uh, you know, let, let me just clarify this. This doesn't mean perfection. Okay, the holiness, uh, us being holy as God is holy doesn't mean you're never going to mess up. Because if you have that in your mind, you go, well, what happens when I mess up? I'm just a failure. No, you're not. You're just, every day of your life, you should get up and you should make an attempt to try to emulate your life after God's. And that's what it means to be consecrated and set apart. Let's go back to the story and then we're almost done. Verse 6 in Isaiah 6. Here's what it says. It says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Verse 8. Then I heard, a, then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to, these peop to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. And that's a beautiful thing that Isaiah did 
where God said, I'm looking for some, matter of fact, I, I'm just going to close out with just two thoughts about this passage. Number one, first thought is that God is looking for some volunteers, okay? God is looking for, the, the Marines used to have a slogan, said we're looking for a few good men, remember that? They don't, they don't use that anymore, probably for reasons that are obvious, but, but, um, but it used to be we're looking for a few good men. And here's the thing about God, like God's not so concerned about your ability, as much as your availability, okay? You need to understand that. Like, God is looking for people who are just available. You might go, well, Pastor Joey, I, 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 you know, I'm not really qualified to get up and preach a sermon. I don't know that much about it. That's all right. I, I don't have a, any musical talent. I'm not going to sing a song. That's okay. That's not what it means necessarily to serve God. Those are included. But there's all kinds of ways that God wants to use you. And all you have to do is just raise your hand and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Where is he going to send you to? He might send you. And I want, I want to just talk about this real quick. This is just kind of a dream that I have. I want our church in the next five years, okay? This is just a goal that I have. In the next five years, I want our church. I want somebody from our church, a young person, an older person, doesn't even matter, a retired person, someone with five kids and married. I don't even care. Someone to raise their hand and say, God spoke to me. about, Or I, I raise my hand, I surrender, and God's calling me to go be a missionary in a foreign land. That could be South America. It could be in Europe somewhere. It could be Africa. It doesn't matter. God need. There are people all around the world that need the gospel, and we need to send some people. And I have it as a goal, as a dream of Grace Church that we want to be a sending church. So we want to raise up some missionaries that will go to Bible college and learn everything they need to learn about being a missionary and then go with their family and go be a missionary somewhere. So pray about that. I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to every person in here. You say, I, I'm, I'm past that. Age. No, you're not, man. God, God takes volunteers. You just raise your hand and say, God, I will go anywhere. I will do anything you tell me to do. And if you do that, he's, he's probably going to make you uncomfortable. He's going he's gonna to send you some places. But it, what, what would you rather be? Would you rather be in Africa in the will of God or here in America out of the will of God? And I'm not saying he's going to send you to Africa. That's what everybody thinks. I'm going to be living in some hut in the middle of a jungle. That's not necessarily the, church, the, the case. You could go to London. You could go to Bolivia. I mean, there's all around the world needs missionaries. And I also want to see somebody from our church be raised up to go plant a church. I want to see somebody get a call from God to say, well, I'm going to go somewhere and we're going to start a new church. And I want our church to be the sending church for that. Okay. But, uh, and so some of you guys, I'm, a, I'm, I'm asking you to consider, you know, at today, just raise your hand, say, Lord, uh, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want. Now, here's what he might say to you. He might call you to be a missionary. He might call you to be a pastor. He might call you to be a pastor's wife. Or he might just say, for the vast majority of you, what he's going to say is, okay, good. Now that I got your attention and, and your availability is the most important thing, I want you not to go to Africa to be a missionary. I want you to stay here, and I want you to be the best employee that your job has and so that they pay you more money so that you can then give more money to missions and then you can help send some people. And I want you to be the best church member Grace Church has. And I want you to be here faithfully every single week. And I want you to serve. And I want you to tithe. And I want you to get involved in a life group. And I want you to become a leader at Grace Church. That's what God wants from every one of you guys. He wants you to be, he, if you're not going to go, he wants you to stay and send people. And he wants you to I, I just believe this with all my heart. The house that you live in right now, wherever it's at, I don't care if it's an apartment, a trailer, a house, God has you there for a reason. Have you ever thought about that? Like God puts you where you are for, you have the job that you have for a reason. God expects you to make a difference at your job. He expects you to make a difference in your neighborhood. And if you're not, you're, you're not really being obedient to the will of God. Like, and, and, and by the way, this is just how God works. I just, I'll, I'll give you a little glimpse of how God works. God's like, okay, you're a steward, and I've given you this amount of money, and I've given you this job, and I've given you, I, I put you in this, in this job, and I put you in this house for a reason. You're not even being obedient with what you got. What makes you think I'm going to give you more? You understand what I'm saying? Like, be obedient where you're at, and God will give you more. God will call you to greater things. But it starts with where you're at.